Okay. All right, so we are streaming on YouTube now. And we're going to start in about one more minute. So good to see everyone. It's always fun to start a new cycle of discovering Buddhism. See some new faces, see some familiar faces. Hey, Lori. Hey, how are you, Linda? Good, great. Glad to see you. Okay. Still got some folks joining us. I'm gonna give it another minute. We're right at seven o'clock now. Hold off for another minute or so, and then we'll get started. Wonderful to see everyone. Like I said, I'm always excited to start a new cycle of discovering Buddhism. So fun. And it's so good to see everyone. All right. Okay. So I think we can go ahead and get started. Um, I just want to introduce myself real quick. I am Linda Saw, and I am not the instructor for this course. I am the program assistant for Discovering Buddhism. So I'm here to hopefully help things run smoothly. I cannot always guarantee that, especially in this virtual world in which we are currently living. Um, it seems like technology always, you know, trips us up and gives us a little bit of a lesson in patience. Um, but I do want to welcome you. This is a new two-year cycle of Discovering Buddhism. So this is module one of, there's really 14 modules in the Discovering Buddhism course. The Kadampa Center offers modules or classes for modules one through 13. The 14th module is a little more in-depth. Um, and that has to be done through the FPMT. And I'll talk about that momentarily. Um, I do want to go through how best to view us and interact with us on um, whether you're streaming on YouTube or through Zoom. Um, probably by now, most of you have used Zoom and are familiar with Zoom, but if not, um, if you hold your cursor somewhere on your screen, probably a line will pop up like a toolbar, and it's usually either at the bottom of your screen or the top of your screen, and you might see that chat box. So you can certainly type your questions or comments into that chat box. Um, typically, tonight's instructor is Robbie Watkins, who we'll see momentarily. And typically the instructors will um, you know, pause for questions. But if you do have a question and you don't want to forget it, go ahead and type it in that chat box and we will get to it. Um, if you are on YouTube and watching that way, there's a chat feature on YouTube as well. And I will be monitoring that and looking for questions on YouTube. So you can also leave your questions there. We do ask that you stay muted during class unless um, either Robbie or I have asked you to unmute to either ask your question or share a, a comment. Um, and that's only because it, things get crazy when there's more than one person trying to talk. Um, and then let's see, when Robbie or I am sharing our screen, which will probably happen <laughs> um, you know, throughout class, the best thing to do is put it on uh, speaker view. So if you move your cursor on your screen, a little gallery view or speaker view will pop up and you can put that on speaker view. 
And if you want to see, you know, either Robbie or I with our screen share, um, you can adjust that and make our, our picture, our video small and kind of off to the side, simply by moving your cursor kind of in between the share screen and our picture. I'm not sharing anything right now, so you won't see how to do that yet. Um, and then in regards to finding things for discovering Buddhism, I am going to go ahead and share my screen now and we're going to walk through this real quick and then I promise you we're going to get to class. So I'm going to bring up the Kadampa Center's website, which hopefully you all are familiar with that. And there we are on YouTube. Hang on a second, let me get there. Ha, there we are. Okay, does everyone see? the um, Kadampa Center website at this point. Give me a thumbs up if you see that. Yes, thank you. Okay, good. So if you're not familiar with the Kadampa Center website, I do encourage you to become familiar with it. So just simply go to kadampa-center.org and here is a wealth of information. First of all, I like to point you up to the top right hand corner where it says calendar. So the calendar feature shows everything that's happening at the Kadampa Center and there's so much going on again, even in this virtual world in which we find ourselves. There's so many practices and classes um, to check out online. So please check out the calendar feature and see what's coming up. And then specifically for discovering Buddhism, if you hover your cursor over spiritual program, there's that drop down menu there, and there's more than one way to get here. Um, but this is what I find to be easiest. So under spiritual program, you slide down to beginner programs, which you'll see me moving my cursor here, and then slide on over to discovering Buddhism material. And if you click on that, that will take you to, well, discovering Buddhism materials. And here is where we have everything. If you scroll down, you will see right here, 2021-2022 DB, which is discovering Buddhism, documents and links. And you can see we're on module one, mind and its potential. And I have already posted the information for this module there online. So we're gonna click on that and go through this very quickly. I know you guys wanna to get to class and hear what Robbie has to say. Um, this comes up and here we've got a quick introduction about discovering Buddhism. This course is designed or was developed through the FPMT, which is the foundation for the preservation of the Mahayana tradition. And again, just, um, Kadampa Center does offer classes for the first 13 modules. The instructor for this module is Robbie Watkins. We have four different instructors that will rotate through teaching these, these modules. Again, I am the program assistant. You can reach me at this email address that's listed there. Um, our classes, I think I've already covered this, can be either viewed through Zoom or watched on YouTube. If you do miss a class, you can actually go to YouTube recordings of the class simply by clicking here. And this information is on the Kanampa Center website, of course. Um, this current module that we are getting ready to start has six sessions. So for the next six Mondays, we will be joining from seven until about 8.30 on the following dates from now through February 8th. There are some online readings, which you can access here or that screen before I clicked on this. There's also books that are available um, either at the Kadampa Center bookstore or to purchase online. And then of course, I want to mention that all of our classes that are given through Kadampa Center are free. So donations are of course greatly accepted. And there are multiple different ways, whichever works best for you um, to, to donate and give to keep these classes going and to keep lights on at the Kadampa Center and keep our technology going like this. Hopefully someday soon, we will once again be in person sharing these classes together. Um, these are the four different ways you can um, certainly give and offer some generosity up. 
The Kadampa Center is no longer going to do a certificate for each module that you might complete, but that can be done and I highly encourage you to do so through the FPMT. And that's this bottom part of this, this screen here. I'm not going to read through this because this is something you can read through at home if you are interested in working towards um, earning a certificate of achievement for each of the modules. You can do that through the FPMT as well as at the end if you want to do all of them and earn an entire Discovering Buddhism completion certificate saying that you have done all of the modules including module 14 which is a doozy so I recommend that you read about that module now don't wait until you've in two years from now. And there is information um, on the FPMT website and you can access it from here. All right, so without further ado then, I am gonna stop sharing my screen and I am going to turn it over to Robbie at this point. Let's see here, let me get back to Robbie. Um, hmm, where is Robbie? I have lost him, there he is, okay. Here I am. Here hey. I am. <laughs> Good evening. Um, let's see, Donna, did you want to say anything or are you just observing? I'm just, I'm just observing, just hanging out. Hi, everybody. I'll say that. Welcome. Okay, great. Well, uh, thank you, Linda, for that wonderful introduction. Um, and welcome, everyone, to the beginning of another exciting Discovering Buddhism uh, series. Uh, I encourage you to participate and if possible do the whole two years and uh, you'll really have a solid foundation for any of the teachings that are given at any level at Kadampa Center from beginning to moderate to advanced if you uh, participate in all the Discovering Buddhism modules. Uh, my name is Robbie Watkins. I've been a member of Kadampa Center since 1993 and I've been teaching the various Discovering Buddhism modules for about 20 years now, I guess we've been giving these. Do you, rem do you remember when it started, Donna? Do you know what year we first started teaching Discovering Buddhism? Um, it's, it's close to 20 years, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, and I teach different modules, but this is one that I teach more than the others. I, I, I love this module, and I think I can say with uh, complete confidence that it's the most important of all the modules, not because I'm teaching it, but because it really is the basis for everything to follow. When we talk about Buddhism, we are talking about working with our mind. Uh, Buddhism has frequently been referred to as a mind science. Uh, whether it qualifies as a religion is a subject for debate, but it's definitely about working with our mind. And everything that goes on at Kadampa Center, I mean, you may come in and see these elaborate displays on the altar and these vivid tankas or pictures hanging down from the wall and hear people chanting and reading these really obscure text and doing prostrations and walking around the stupa. Everything is done to work with our mind, to develop our mind's innate qualities of wisdom and compassion, the two aspects of enlightenment or Buddhahood, so that we ourselves become a Buddha. So in order to work with our mind, we have to understand exactly what it is and develop a little bit of insight into how it functions. Uh, we can't really work with it if we don't understand it at all. So that's what this module is about. What is our mind? How does it function? And I found if you ever get, if you're at something at Kadampa Center and you're just saying, what in the world is this? What's the point of this? I don't get it. If you just come back to the basics that this is about developing my mind, developing my wisdom and compassion, then I think that keeps you really grounded for everything you may encounter at Kadampa Center or at any other Buddhist center that you may visit. So that's just a little plug for this module. 
We have uh, six weeks together. I like to try and keep the sessions between an hour and an hour and 10 minutes because I really think people get a little bit zoomed out any longer than that. Uh, it may not work every night, but I'm going to try and keep to that. Um, I will take questions, maybe not tonight, we'll see how it goes, but at each of the following nights there'll be time for questions. I really like the questions and answers. Um, the readings that uh, are on the pages on the website that Linda showed you, and thank you for setting that up, Linda. That's really great. It's so well organized. The readings are do not parallel the class, what we talk about in classes exactly. So don't let that bother you. The readings are a supplement to the main topics that I'll be covering in the class. So the goal is to do all the readings by the end of the six weeks, uh, but don't expect them to parallel very closely what we'll be talking about. Um, let's see, I'm gonna to go to gallery view for a minute. And I just like to, you know, some people don't have the uh, camera on and that's fine, but I'd just like to get a sense of who's in the class tonight. Do we have anyone who's done this module before taking the class? Raise your hand in front of the computer. Okay, so we have some people who've done it before. And do you do it with me? If you did it with me, raise your hand. Okay, it looks like some people did it. Okay. Um, do we have anyone who's brand new to Buddhism tonight? That's it. See, okay, we've got a couple hands, that's good. Okay. And do we have anybody who's done the whole uh, 13 modules already and is repeating the cycle? Yeah, we do have some people there. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I'm going to aim this module towards the people who are relatively new. So those of you who have been through all 13 modules may be hearing stuff that you've heard before. And I'm not going to apologize uh, for that because hearing this stuff over and over again really cements it in our mind. So the, some of this stuff you can't hear too often. Um, the homework will be to do meditations in between the weekly classes and we'll talk about that later and we'll talk about what meditation is and what you're gonna be expected to do. But we're going to start with a video that was uh, produced by the FPMT. They did um, video introductions to each module. And as I remember it, this is one of the better ones. So I think Linda's gonna show that on our screen and we can watch the video. Okay, bear with me for just a moment. Let me get that up and ready. All right, and if there's any problems in viewing it or hearing it, just let me know. Type it in the chat box and I will try to troubleshoot that. Hopefully it's going to work beautifully for us this evening. Uh, I'm not getting any sound. Okay, hang on. Let me just stop for a moment. Hang on one second. Ah, here we go. Let's try this one. Do you have sound now, Robbie?
We live in a fortunate age. Maybe you think I mean the modern age. Actually, I mean Buddhism has taken root in the West. Until recently, qualified teachers of Mahayana Buddhism outside of Asia have been few and far between. We've had to travel to the Far East to find deep teachings in the subjects of compassion, emptiness, karma, and enlightenment. Today it's an amazing gift that we can learn about the ancient teachings of the Buddha through this 13-part video series. You will receive teachings from some of the greatest teachers, Tibetan and Western, men and women, living in the world today. You will hear personal interviews with Buddhist practitioners who share their experiences of putting the teachings into practice. You will have the opportunity to gain some understanding of Buddhism and learn skills that you can use to make your life most meaningful. Despite our achievements with science and technology, we still don't know much about the mind and its potential. Yet in fact, 2,500 years ago, Shakyamuni Buddha realized the full potential of the mind. He understood that the mind is not just the brain. The mind is beginningless, and it creates our experiences of the world. Because what we perceive as reality is a function of the mind, not only do we have the power to completely eliminate disturbing emotions like anger, but we can consciously progress to the highest evolutionary state possible, Buddhahood. Every living being has the potential to reach this limitless state of wisdom and compassion. Buddhism teaches us that as we begin to understand the true nature of our mind, we become happier, and more peaceful, and better able to deal with problems, which makes us better able to help others. In this 13-part series of Discovering Buddhism videos, you are about to embark on the study of Mahayana Buddhism. Now, in the practice of Mahayana Buddhism, the concept of motivation is extremely important. For example, if someone were to give you a gift with an ulterior motive, say, to receive something in return, then that wouldn't feel like such a positive action. But if someone gives you a gift just for the sheer pleasure of seeing the happiness on your face when you receive it, that feels like a very positive thing to do. In the same way, in our spiritual practice, motivation, the reason that we do an action, is just as important as the action that we do. Therefore, at the beginning of each of these teachings in this series, we are going to generate a positive motivation, a Mahayana motivation, that focuses not so much on our own well-being, but instead emphasizes generating the wish to be able to benefit other living beings and bring them happiness as much as possible. In Mind and Its Potential, the first in this series, we are going to explore the limitless potential of our own minds to bring happiness both to ourselves as well as to other living beings. And so for this reason, again, our motivation as we listen to these teachings is very important. So let's just take a moment right now to generate in our minds a strong thought, the thought wishing to be able to use these teachings in order to be able not only to bring happiness to ourselves, but also to be able to bring happiness and well-being to the others around us. Okay, mind. 
you're generally speaking in Buddhism, you can say it's synonymous with the word consciousness, number one. Number two, this mind of ours, in Buddhist terms, there's not one atom of physicality about it. It's not physical. It's interesting. In the Christian view, there is, we talk about this sort of this part of you called the soul that isn't physical, isn't it? Then we have the materialist view, which is there is simply the brain, simply the DNA, the genes, and that's it. So these two other these two views. Well, Buddhism is neither of these. Buddhism has the view that all of the mind, all of what you know, all of the mind. And what that word refers to is the entire spectrum of our inner experiences, intellect, thoughts, concepts, feelings, emotions, unconscious, subconscious, spirit, whatever you want to call, you know, instinct, intuition, you name it. All of this is encompassed by the term mind in Buddhism, or consciousness, okay? The other point about this mind of ours, or about any part of our mind, which is where it again radically differs from all other religious views, is there's not one atom of our being that's created by a superior being, God, Buddha, whatever you like. Nothing. Not possible. Buddha says it's just not on. It's just his view, you know, from his own experience has discovered this to be the truth. And the other interesting point, which is where it differs radically, again, from, the, from all the Western psychological views, is there's not one atom of our mind, our personality, our thoughts, our feelings, our emotions, that's created by mum and dad. I mean, big surprise. We have to stop blaming them, okay? There's no part of our mind that comes from our mother and father. Clearly the body does. Thank you, mother and father. They provide us with an egg and sperm, you know, which is the basis of this body. How fortunate we are. So, you know, in Buddhist terms, your mind isn't physical. It doesn't come from mum and dad. It doesn't come from God or Buddha or any other superior being. Clearly it can't come from nothing. We all know that anything you point to in this universe has a continuity. You know, this thing here comes from metal and plastic and goes back and back. This cup, the same. The flowers, everything has a continuity. Suddenly there's one moment nothing and then one moment a flower. We all know that's absurd. So clearly with the mind it's not possible. Same thing. So mind or consciousness, not physical. It comes from a, a, pre a previous moments of itself. It's like a river of mental moments. Mental continuum, they call it, you know. This whole idea of, of mind being beginningless. Because if you follow this concept through now, this lot, intellectually, conceptually, you can't find any conclusion other than the fact that the mind has to be beginningless. Because this process of cause and effect, you know, chicken and egg. How can you have a first chicken? Okay, Christians and Muslims and all the most religions point to God as the source. Where do I come from? From God. Buddha says no. You come from previous moments of your own consciousness. So if you trace it back and you think, well, maybe it began 32, 32 years ago. Maybe it began 52 lives ago. Any given moment you say, maybe it began then, you have to say there was a moment of mind existing. So if it existed then, there has, it has to have come from a previous moment, doesn't it? Conclusion, your consciousness is beginningless. This is the Buddhist idea. Okay. The, uh, the other point that's so crucial is this idea of Buddha nature. What does this mean? You know, because the big question we all have, we all have these questions. We say, "Who am I?" You know, "What is my purpose? Why am I here?" Okay, Buddha says the answer to those questions is to be a Buddha. What's Buddha? Buddha is Sanskrit. It means fully awake. And actually, all it's referring to. You know, is 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 the is the state is is the is the fully developed consciousness mind beyond which it can't be developed further. What Buddha means is a, a mind, a being, a consciousness that's fully developed in all, simply speaking, in all what we call the positive qualities, and absolutely free of the negative ones. So simple. There's a simple way of saying, and what Buddha is saying is that is who we really are. We all possess, the term they use is, we all possess Buddha nature. Well, a simple way of saying this is this, you know, that it's like, let's use the analogy of an acorn. Mummy, what's that, you know? Oh, well, darling, that's an acorn. What's an acorn, mummy? Well, that, 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 you know, then she points to the oak tree. She, well, that will become that. Oh, how interesting, you know? So then when you, you know, you mightn't say, what's the nature of an acorn? You might just say, what is it? When you see an acorn, what you're really seeing is a potential oak tree. Isn't it? You know, some, you know, it's a cute little brown thing. Sure, you could use it for this and that, and you could use it for jewelry, you could use it as a weapon if you like, but kind of how dumb. What it really is, isn't it? You see, what its true nature is, we don't use those words, but you listen to it. What it really is, is a potential oak tree. So how foolish not to develop into an oak tree. How ridiculous, isn't it? Well, that's what Buddha's saying. Mind, consciousness, which is indestructible, which is not created, 
its true nature, what it really is, is a potential Buddha, a fully developed mind. It's not as if we have a choice about it. You have an option. It's not as if some people like Mother Teresa are born to be Buddhas, you know, kind of like potluck. Not like that. No, by definition, an acorn is something that if you give it all the appropriate conditions, will become an oak tree. It's not as if you can turn it into an apple tree if you want to. How stupid. So this is the attitude we have to slowly develop about ourselves. What's kind of interesting now is because we don't really know who we really are, Buddha says. We identify with, with this little kind of brown, undeveloped thing. Well, I'm this, I'm that, I'm lazy, I'm fat, I'm human, I'm female, I'm no good, I'm, I'm special, I'm delicious, I'm ugly, I'm beautiful, you name it. We're kind of defining ourselves by this little brown thing. How boring, how stupid, how short tunnel vision, you know. A Buddha, which is your true nature, which is what your oak tree is, when you're fully developed, you, you'll have the fully developed two wings. Infinite empathy with all living beings, all living beings, beyond which, you know, uh, totally developed, beyond which you can't develop it further. And this empathy would be such that, as if they were all you. There's no separation. Huge empathy, huge wish, spontaneous wish to benefit each one perfectly. Second, you'd have fully developed wisdom wing, which literally in Buddhist terms is called omniscience. And my, my mum thought this was very arrogant. Only God is omniscient. But Buddha says... Every living being, if you possess mind, your mind has the potential to know everything. So, the, so this is just something totally natural, Buddha says, that our mind has the capacity to literally know everything. And when we have fully removed all the pollution from the mind, all the delusions, then our mind will be in sync with reality, quite literally. Buddha says we're way out of sync with reality right now because of all the pollution in the mind. So we fully develop, we'll be omniscient. Omniscient, infinite compassion. And there's a third quality, not a wing, that's called literally, if you like, omnipotence. The effortless power to do whatever needs to be done to benefit each one of these countless living beings in the, in the entire universe, to ben benefit them perfectly based on the wisdom that sees their minds perfectly and knows precisely what to do and how to benefit them. And that would include, in fact, the capacity to manifest your own mind, your Buddha mind, in millions of forms throughout millions of universes for millions of eons as long as suffering sentient beings exist. That's a Buddha, okay? That's enlightenment. Enlightenment isn't just some kind of nice feeling, okay? It's a little bit more than that. This is enlightenment. And Buddha says that's your true nature. That's who you can become. That simply is naturally who you really are. You're not it yet, but this whole idea of once you really appreciate what an acorn really is, you will treat it with such respect. And this is the attitude we have to develop about ourselves. It's hugely inspiring, actually, which is why it's so important to hear this very first. start to discover more and more that the, uh, the, the source of our, hap of our suffering um, l comes from our mind. There are external conditions for our suffering, definitely. There are many, many external conditions for our suffering to arise. But the root cause of our suffering, the Buddha taught, lies within our own mind. And in fact, even meeting the external conditions is something to do with our mind. So the more we understand that, the, that, that our own mind is the source of our suffering and also, fortunately, our own mind is the source of our happiness, then we, we begin to understand that we, th the only way to be free of suffering is to change our mind to, and to change it radically. If we change it a little bit, we will, we will overcome a little bit of suffering. But if we radically change our mind, bring about a real revolution in our mind, and, and 
and eliminate the disturbing thoughts from our mind and develop the, the, all the positive qualities of our mind, then we can be completely free of suffering and develop real happiness. Because, again, the happiness that we're seeking is, is not something temporary, superficial. We may not, never have thought about what happiness we're seeking, but if we check up, we want a happiness that is perfect and lasting. Buddhism says that there is this amazing phenomena called mind, which is not the brain, it is not something physical, it is something formless, not having any qualities to, uh, of, of physical matter. The mind is something which is clear, formless, and has the ability to know. In fact, mind is the only thing that knows, experiences, and feels. Mind's job is to know. In every, in every way, the word know, we can, we can analyze this word and discover that there are many ways to know. Right now, we ourselves know in quite uh, indirect and superficial ways mostly through concepts, mostly through reading, being told things by others. So right now, we are knowing in a very limited way. This is because our mind is being prevented from knowing, knowing perfectly, completely, by the disturbing thoughts that all of us have. So we can imagine, we can imagine what it would be like without these disturbing thoughts none of them whatsoever. There was nothing disturbing the, the innate, ability, uh, innate ability of our mind to know and experience and feel. Yeah. I think this would be an amazing experience, something truly amazing. Without these distractions, the, all, these conf all this confusion in the mind, then the mind could just know. But is it possible to get rid of these disturbing thoughts? So this, this is also a very big question. This is what the whole Buddha Dharma is about. But also, maybe we can get some feeling that it is possible because also, when we meditate, or try to meditate, if by placing our mind on an object, such as the breath, although we're not able to keep our mind on the breath for a long time, perfectly, totally experience 100% the breath, become union oneness with the breath. Still, by putting some effort in doing that, what happens? We all experience, if we try and do it, for some time, that our disturbing thoughts, the agitation in our mind, does reduce. Yes? Hopefully we've all had that experience at, le <laughs> at least one time, and for a sh at least for a short time, that um, the disturbing thoughts, they, may, they don't go away completely, but at least they decline. This shows, this is actually an indication that, that these disturbing thoughts have no power from their own side to control the mind. And that, oh, maybe I can do my great demonstration. Sorry. Normally, this is... Center directors don't like this demonstration because I destroy that. But normally, our mind is like that. <laughs> that is our mind, completely shaken, disturbed. But if we stop, if I stop shaking this water, which will make the director very happy, then what happens? The water returns to its natural state. It isn't natural for water to be agitated. Something else is doing that. And when you stop the agitation, the water 
just naturally, without any other factors involved, goes back to its natural state. It returns to being level, still, and then it also has the ability, when it's calm and clear, it has the ability to reflect things. When it's completely agitated, the surface of the water has no ability to ref reflect things accurately. We can also notice that when we do even a little simple breathing meditation, our mind starts to become calmer and clearer, more still, because that's its natural state. We've never, we've never experienced this natural state, but that is its natural state, and it always has the tendency to return to it. Think about it. Understanding the true nature of the mind has helped me um, gradually over a period of, I'd say, about three years of just sort of letting that filter down. Um, it doesn't happen suddenly. It didn't happen suddenly. It happened very gradually. Let's say I wake up, you know, uh, recently and, and, and think, wow, you know, I'm a different person. I have more self-confidence. And uh, because you start to realize that um, you're not this limited, hopeless, helpless being who's, who's under the, you know, the influence of, of all these things outside and all these things inside that, that cause so much suffering. When people come up to me and ask me about being a Buddhist nun and about Buddhism, Many, many people have this, uh, they've already decided that Buddhism is this dark, gloomy, pessimistic, nihilistic religion that talks about suffering and death. <laughs> and uh, that's, you know, we, we do talk about suffering and death a lot, but we talk about it in... Um, in a way where we're looking at the situation that we're in. And this is really the situation we're in. We're suffering and we're, we have to die. And, um, but there's a solution to it. That's what, that's what everybody seems to forget that part. There's a solution. And the solution is that we have this pure potential of our mind that's unbelievable. That we can become these incredible beings. These Buddhas. What they call Buddhas. You can call it whatever you want, but it's, it's, it's this potential to become beyond whatever, whatever your imagination can come up with, a powerful, all-knowing, blissful being who can help everyone. I always wanted to help people. Since I was a little girl, I recognized that people were suffering. My parents were suffering, my, my grandparents, everyone. I, I recognized their suffering. Um, I recognized my own suffering. And, but as I grew up and became an adult, my own suffering overwhelmed me so much that I didn't feel like I could help other people. I couldn't even help myself. And gradually through this understanding um, and some little bit of taste, experience, <clears throat> that I do have this incredible nature. Um, more and more, I am, I am, I seem to be helping more and more people and thinking less and less about my own suffering. Okay, thank you, Linda.
Can you hear me? Yes, yeah, sorry, I'm trying to get the, okay. <laughs> the audio off. Hang on. Okay. Well, I think if you understand everything that was said in that uh, video, you'll have mastered all the material that we're going to cover in this module. Uh, but we're going to take it a little bit slower and spread it out over six weeks. Uh, as I said, the basis for this module and all the other modules involves having a semi-regular meditation practice. Uh, when does uh, establishing a daily practice come in the sequence of modules, Linda? Oh, you know what? I would have to check that out. Uh, that's I'll, okay. I'll it's, let you it's know. It's coming when up I, in the when I see it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, that will go into a lot more detail about establishing a meditation practice, but we certainly need the basics uh, for this module and all the other ones that are to follow. So uh, we're gonna to start tonight with uh, some simple instructions on meditation and uh, do a little bit of meditation practice. Normally we would start with some of our prayers, uh, but on the for the, purpose of saving time. We're not going to go into the prayers tonight. We'll, over the next uh, five weeks, we'll go through the normal prayers that we say at Kadampa Center and try and understand a little bit what they mean so that we're not just repeating them mindlessly. But tonight we're going to skip uh, the prayers. Instead, we're going to go straight into our meditation. And as many of you know, the word in Tibetan for meditation is gom, G-O-M. And that's why the room at Kadampa, the large room at Kadampa Center is called the Gompa, G-O-M-P-A, room for meditation. And the, the meditation is a practice that's common to many religious traditions. Uh, so it's particularly associated with Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism. And meditation in Tibetan Buddhism is defined as becoming familiar with a chosen object. Okay, so uh, the process of meditation is looking at, exploring, becoming familiar with a specific topic. And in this module, the topic will be the mind and its nature. We're going to become familiar with that through study in these Monday night sessions, through contemplation, which is thinking in a non-distracted manner about the subject, and through meditation, which is sitting in meditation posture and trying to single, with great concentration, become familiar with the chosen topic. Um, so those are the three aspects of study in Tibet, or, or of learning in Tibetan Buddhism. There's study, contemplation, and meditation. And they're the three uh, legs of the stool that we uh, sit upon as we attempt to develop our mind. So meditation is becoming familiar with. It's not going blank or spacing out. It's our mind actually becoming more focused, more concentrated, more alert as we approach the chosen topic or the chosen object of the meditation, which is the term we use frequently. Uh, so we begin by establishing our meditation posture and I imagine that most people are sitting on a chair, not on the floor. So if you're sitting in a chair like I am, sit a little bit towards the front. Don't slump back in the chair, but sit a little bit towards the front. Have your feet nice and flat on the floor. Your back is a little bit straighter than you would normally sit. Not rigid, but just a little bit straighter. Your head is not tilted to one side or the other, 
but straight, maybe just a couple degrees in front of the vertical. Your eyes are either lightly closed or just slightly open so that a little bit of light comes in. Either one is fine. The lips are lightly closed, not pursed, not tight. The tongue is against the upper palate. Our shoulders are down, not hunched up around our neck, but down and a little bit back so that our chest is open. Our upper arms are away from the sides of our body. Our right hand is on left with our thumbs touching. And this is slightly below the level of our navel resting in our lap. And that represents the union of compassion or universal empathy as Venerable Rabina described it in the video and wisdom, which traditionally is referred to as seeing reality directly without misinterpretation. So the combination of those two is enlightenment or the state of Buddhahood that is possible for every one of us. And again, as, as I said, if we're sitting on the chair, our feet are flat on the floor. If you are on a cushion, your legs are in a position that you find comfortable and stable. So part of the point of the meditation posture, again, the point is not to torture yourself, not to be miserable, but it's meant to be stable. And once established, it's non-distracting. So we're not constantly thinking about our posture during the meditation that follows. It also opens up the energy channels that flow from the top of our head, in front of our spine, down to the level of the genitalia. And these can't be seen when we dissect the body, but there are certain channels or chakras that the winds, W-I-N-D-S, uh, which are various energy flows in the body travel. And it's said that the consciousness rides on these winds. So this opens those up to benefit our meditation. So take a moment and check your posture beginning at the top and working down. And if you identify sources of distraction or discomfort, address those now so they don't come up over and over again during the meditation. And now to help settle our minds, not to go to sleep, but to become more alert, more focused, more aware, we take three deep breaths from the abdomen, meaning that the stomach expands as we breathe in, our diaphragm is pulled down and our lungs are completely filled. And then on the out breath, our stomach contracts towards our spine, so that as much air as possible is expelled. So we do that just three times. We don't want to do it more than that. And it's okay to make a little bit of breathing noise during that. And now we allow our breathing to return to its normal pattern. And we always begin by setting our motivation. If we had done our prayers, those would have begun the process. 
but we can take for a moment and sit and think about our motivation. And whatever motivation has brought us here tonight is great. If it's just curiosity, that's fine. If we just want a little peace and quiet, that's wonderful. But the Buddha, the historical figure who lived 2,500 years ago, said that the most powerful motivation, the one that gives the most energy to our meditation practice and produces the greatest changes in our mind is what's referred to as the bodhicitta motivation. The thought that everything I do, even something is sitting quietly in meditation for the next few minutes, is done for the purpose of developing my mind, developing my qualities of compassion and wisdom so that I can benefit others. And for most of that, that's probably not a normal or easy way to think. So if we can just repeat the words, just kind of force out a little bit of that motivation. That's perfectly fine. So we'll take a minute and set our motivation. And having set our motivation, we begin our meditation. And tonight we're going to do a very simple concentration meditation. Placing the mind on the chosen object and keeping it there for the duration of the meditation. And the object we're using is the physical movement of the breath in and out through our nostrils. Just the slightly cool sensation of air moving in and out. We're not visualizing it. We're not looking at ourselves breathing. We're not even counting our breath. We're just placing our mind, our awareness, our consciousness on the physical movement of the breath. Direct perception. So that the mind and what it perceives can be said to become one. The mind and the breath are indistinguishable. Consciousness and breath are one. And of course, we notice very quickly that our mind and our breath aren't one. That our breath continues, but our mind has wandered off to what we need to do to, at work tomorrow. Or some dishes in the sink that we need to clean tonight. Or how busy things are going to be tomorrow afternoon. The mind has become one with those experiences, with those thoughts. So we just set those aside and come back to the breath. Not with harshness, 
not judgmentally, just accepting that our mind, we've trained our mind very well to wander off, to jump from one thought to another, monkey mind as it's referred to. That's just a habit. And we can set that habit aside and start developing the habit of concentration. Mind on the breath. Coming back over and over and over again. And that is the meditation we'll do for the next few minutes.
And just as we began our meditation with a motivation, we always end with a dedication. We give ourselves a little pat on the back. We acknowledge we've done something out of the ordinary. And we think, may the positive energy that I've created just in this short period of time, may that not be lost, but may it make an imprint on my mind that in the future ripens in a way to benefit all sentient beings. And you can relax your concentration I didn't see anybody fall out of their computer frame, <laughs> fall off their chair or anything, so that's good. Uh, this coming week, the homework is to meditate for 10 minutes, six days out of the week in that format. Set your motivation, establish your posture, set your motivation, awareness, concentration on the breath, and then finish with a dedication. Six times 10, okay? And make it easy for yourself. Plan in advance what time of day you're going to do this. Don't think that 10 minutes is just gonna show up uh, fortuitously and at some point during the day, because it won't if you don't plan it. it. Doesn't have to be in the morning, it can be morning, evening, whatever works for you. Plan the location. If you have an altar, that's great, but there's no necessity to set up an altar. That's not really something we talk about in this class. Uh, but set up the location with either a chair or a cushion. Let all the other people and animals in the house know that you're, this is your private time for the next 10 minutes and you're not to be disturbed. And uh, approach it with a little bit of uh, enjoyment, not as a, something you have to do, but something that you can look forward to and will improve the quality of your life pretty quickly, I think. So that's the medita meditation, which is the basis for this and all the other modules. Um, this module we will be talking about mind and its potential. The model of the mind as Venable Rabina presented is that, that was uh, is taught by the, historical Buddha, Buddha Shakyamuni, a historical figure who lived 2,500 years ago in Northern India. He was an ordinary person like any of us. He sat under the Bodhi tree and simply by looking at his mind, what we're going to be doing in this module and all the rest, working with it, developing his qualities of compassion or empathy and wisdom, he became a Buddha, okay? And he did it just by sitting and working with his mind. That's all he did. And he what traveled from his state of confusion and suffering that most of us find ourselves in now to the state of a Buddha. And he said, this is what I learned about my mind. This is what I found worked for me. I'm offering it to you. I'm not a God. I can't do the work for you. If this is something that interests you, you have to do the work yourself. But I'm sharing with you what I learned. It said that all a Buddha really can do is teach. An enlightened being can teach what he knows. Okay, so this is what the historical Buddha whose teachings have been preserved. When we're at Kadampa Center, you see them on the altar behind all the text up there. Those are the teachings of the historical Buddha. And he also said, don't take my word for it. Everything that I say, you must test against your own experience. If you find it valid, if you find it rings true for you, if it makes sense, use it. If it doesn't seem valid, if it seems false, set it aside. But everything that he said, taught, the Buddha said, test it against your own experience. So that um, 
that spirit of open-minded questioning is the way to approach everything that I'm, I will be sharing in this class and everything that's presented in the other modules. None of it has to be accepted on blind faith. It's perfectly okay to say, this makes sense to me, I'll hold on to this. Do this doesn't make sense, I'll set it aside. You don't have to buy the whole farm, so to speak. So that's the uh, spirit to approach the teachings. Uh, just to give a preview of what we'll be talking about next week, we'll be talking about the nature of the mind. And it was touched on in the film. I'm just going to mention these characteristics very briefly and not explain them. I want you to just think about them during this week, and then we'll come together next week and talk about uh, these. And there are four things three characteristics of the mind and one function. And if you get nothing else out of this module, if you can remember those four things, you will have served yourself very well, okay? The first is that, as Venerable Rabina said, mind or consciousness or awareness, using all these terms somewhat interchangeably, is completely non-physical. It is the non-physical aspect of our being. According to the Buddha, we're body and mind, the physical aspects and the non-physical. Now, certainly they interact. Our mind experience, interacts with the five senses. That's how we relate to the physical world around us. The mind relates to the brain, but the brain is not the eye. It's not the nose excuse me, the mind is not the eye, it's not the nose, it's not the brain. It's the non-physical aspect of our experience. We can sit for a moment and think, you know, it's kind of like something inside us that's watching. That's what an image we have lots of times, but it is completely non-physical. So the mind is not subject to the laws that physical objects are subject to, okay? It's the non-physical aspect of our being and it's very different in the way it acts and the way it, what happens to it to, compared to the physical aspect. So that's the first characteristic and we'll talk about this in a lot more detail next week. It's non-physical, two, it's without beginning and without end, okay? Every moment of mind, is preceded by a previous moment of mind, preceded by a previous moment of mind, back to 10 years ago, back to 20 years ago, back to when we we're in our mother's womb, okay? And as Venerable Rabina said, our parents, the ermine, ermine speg, the sperm and egg came together. That created the physical aspect of our being. But the mental aspect, the, physical, the consciousness, the non-physical aspect came from a previous moment of mind, okay? It didn't come from the egg. It didn't come from the sperm. According to the Buddha, that's, it would be illogical to think that a non-physical phenomena like mind can come from a physical phenomena, which is egg. So it's said at the moment of conception, when the egg and sperm join, they also join with a particular consciousness. And that can be traced back to previous lifetimes and previous lifetimes before that, back and back with no end. Similarly, going forward, when our physical body dies, the mind does not die with it, okay? It's non-physical. The body dies and decays, the mind continues on without end, okay? There is no end to consciousness. There is no beginning to our consciousness. There is no end to our consciousness. So that's the second characteristic. Mind is without beginning, and without end. The third one is its ultimate nature is clear or clarity or clear light. When we think of our mind in our typical Western psychological model, 
we think our mind is depressed or frustrated by being in quarantine or angry at various politicians. The Buddhist point of view is those are thoughts that arise in our mind, but they are not the mind, okay? The mind is like the empty, clear space in which those thoughts occur. But those thoughts are not the mind. They are just momentary phenomena occurring one after the another in the mind, okay? Certain thoughts tend to come up more often. So we may say, I am an angry person because I have a lot of angry thoughts. In very simple terms, that's just a habit. But the mind itself is not angry. The mind is unstained, uncontaminated by thoughts such as anger or jealousy, okay? Everything we think of as occurring in the mind, thoughts, emotions, memories, intuitions, personal characteristics, they have different qualities, but they're all in the nature of these transient phenomena arising within the clear space of the mind. So the ultimate nature of the mind is clear. So those are the three fundamental characteristics of mind. Non-physical, without beginning, without end, and clear. And the function of the mind, uh, Venerable uh, Dondrup touched on this, is to perceive, is to be aware. Sometimes in text it's referred to as to cognize, okay? Right now, I have a mind that is very irritated that recognizes irritation at certain politicians, okay? My mind recognizes that very easily because it's been trained to do that over the past several years. According to the Buddha, we can train our mind to recognize, perceive qualities such as love, generosity, patience, compassion. We can almost say our mind is like a mirror that reflects, okay, that reflects these transient thoughts and is to perceive, to be aware of, to cognize. And we'll talk about that again next week. So those are four things. Just think about what do those mean for you? There's no right answer. I'll give you the uh, Buddhist party line next week about what I mean when I talk about those. So six days meditate for um, 10 minutes, concentrating on the breath, that's your meditation. Your contemplation is, you know, when you're driving to work, just think about the four, three characteristics of the mind and its function and what does that mean? And then the study is to start the readings that are on the web pages Linda showed us. And um, let's see, is there anything in the chat we need to address this evening, Linda? I'd prefer not to get into questions tonight. No, there is nothing. I've given so, okay. we're good. so that's so that's it for tonight. Let's see, we had 32 people here. And how many, how many did we have on uh, YouTube? Do you know? It was at 1.18. I would say on average, there was 14 joining us on YouTube. Oh, no. So that's a lot of people. Yeah. yeah. About 30, right. 45. Wonderful. It's a great, great class. Thank you, Robbie. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Let's see. Is Donna C still with us? Uh, or is she? I think she ducked okay. out. Okay. Any announcements? Sandy, I see Sandy's here. Did you want to say anything about what's going on at the Even center? No. Sandy's our. Uh, I'm, am I, is, I'm are you here just to here? Take the class. I'm as I'm here okay. to take the class again. This is one of my all-time favorite classes. I think this is my third time in. Like okay. you said, we need the reminder. So, thank you. Okay, if you're new, if you are fairly new to Kadampa Center, like Linda said check out the webpage. Even during these times, there is a lot going on. I think people come, 
you know, people have been coming to Kadampa Center for a while. We recognize most of the people in the video tonight. A lot of us people have been to Kadampa Center because we've had such a wonderful spiritual program for a lot of years. So thank you, everyone. Stay healthy, and we'll get together in a week. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Robbie, and thank you, Linda. Thank you, Robbie. And thank Linda. you, Robbie. Thank you. Have a good week. Good seeing you. Yeah. Thank you. Bye. See you next week. Good seeing you.